Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopez and today I'm joined by Dr. Francesca Minerva. She is a researcher at the University of Milan in Italy. She is the co-founder and co-editor of the Journal of Controversial Ideas. Her research focuses on applied philosophy including Lukeism, conscientious objection, abortion, academic freedom, and cryonics, and those are the topics we're going to talk about today. So, Francesca, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Okay, so let's start. I, I mean, this topic is very interesting because 10 years ago or so you published a very controversial paper about it. Let's start with abortion. So, what are your views on abortion? Um, so I, I'm one of the people who are in favor of abortions, so like pro-choice. Um, and uh, the paper you, you mentioned, though, um, in, extended that pro-choice, um, some of the pro-choice arguments um, to um, newborns. Um, so like the reason why I'm I'm in favor of abortion, and I think um, it's morally permissible to have an abortion. Is that um, I think that um, embryos and and fetuses um, don't really um, have a right to life in the sense that they they don't have any interest in in being born. They don't have an interest at all. Um, they um, therefore, they, they can't really be deprived or, or harmed uh, or wronged um, when uh, you terminate their, their biological life. Therefore, abortion is permissible. There are other arguments in favor of abortion um, that are most concerned about uh, mothers uh, or women's um, right not to have children. But for me, the main argument is the argument based on the fact that um, fetuses and embryos um, can't be harmed um, if you end their existence because they don't have the capacity to have projects for the future, they don't have the capacity to attribute a value to their own life, and when a living being doesn't have those capacities, um, there is no harm in, in ending the, their existence because they wouldn't suffer any harm. Yeah, and that also applies to newborns. Yeah, and in this paper I co-authored that came out in the Journal Medical Ethics in 2012, um, we extended the same argument to newborns. So it wasn't something that we observed first. Um, so other um, philosophers, um, like John Harris, Peter Singer, and uh, Michael Tooley had already pointed out that those capacities are not um, mm, uh, don't appear in newborns or in very young uh, babies as well. Um, but we pushed the argument uh, following the uh, abortion line. So we talked about um, after birth abortion that too many people sounds like absolute nonsense um, but the introduction of this new term was um, because we wanted to highlight the fact that um, there is a strong similarity between having an abortion and um, having um, so between the status of the of the fetus and the moral status of the newborn because a lot of people say that something very important happens when when a fetus um, is born and of course from a legal perspective from a psychological perspective from a social perspective it's true um, so we, we didn't deny that and I wouldn't deny that um, obviously when you uh, when a parent has their baby in their arms and um, when the baby's outside uh, of the womb they become, you know, it's possible to to for them to to be given up for adoption. So uh, definitely, from a legal, social, and psychological perspective, um, there is a difference between a fetus um, and a newborn. But what we wanted to stress is the fact that there is not a big difference um, when you look at the 
cognitive capacities of um, of a fetus and uh, and the newborn in the sense that if you're talking about their capacity to attribute a value to their own life to have projects for the future um, and all these other characteristics that uh, some people think are relevant when we're talking about abortion um, then those characteristics are also missing in, in newborns so that's why we talked about afterbirth abortion Mm -hmm. I understand. And would these principles that you apply to an end-of-life situation like abortion, would they also apply to euthanasia? Um, in the case of euthanasia, um, it, it's quite it's quite different, um, I think, because the usually uh, in the case of euthanasia, you have a grown-up person um, who had um, a life, hopefully a happy life, but um, they've got to the point of their life where um, their suffering is usually unbearable um, because of um, the, the largest case in the largest uh, number of cases because of um, health issues. So um, people who have cancer at a late stage, so they're in a lot of pain, they don't have much um, life. Uh, like to live and they're then they're really living uh, with a lot of of pain in some other cases can be psychological pain i think there have been very few cases but some cases in holland and in belgium of people who requested euthanasia because they the depression uh, was very severe and there was no way of um, curing it with the medications currently available uh, so in that case, um, the person definitely has the capacity to attribute a value to their life. And I think that's the reason why actually they they ask for euthanasia, because they realize that to, to them, that kind of life they're living is really not worth living. It's more a burden than... Um, than a joy, and therefore they they want to exit um, existence um, without without suffering more. So um, in that case, definitely uh, there is there, there is the autonomous choice of ending life. In the case of a fetus, um, fetuses are not capable of any autonomous decisions. I mean, they they don't have the cognitive capacities for that. So there are quite huge asymmetries between entering life and exiting life so between abortion and, and, and euthanasia because the mental the mental capacities are very different mm -hmm. uh, and i know you're also very interested in cryonics you even wrote an entire book on it the ethics of cryonics so could you tell us what cryonics is about and what are the sorts of arguments in favor of it yeah, so cryonics, uh, I don't know if everybody has heard of it. Uh, it's quite of an obscure topic. In, in indeed, um, I wrote the book. I think it's pretty much the only book of the ethics of cryonics. It's considered one of these very weird subjects. But I think it's a very interesting topic, not only because cryonics is inherently interesting, but also because of all the philosophical um, um, topics that are related to, to cryonics. Um, so cryonics is the um, preservation at um, ultra low temperatures of um, of a person um, who has uh, been declared uh, legally dead. Um, so what happens when somebody is, is declared legally dead is that you have a few minutes between the, um, the heart so stop beating and before the, the, the brain starts um, um, experiencing like damage for lack of oxygen in which, um, in, in which the process of cryonics uh, has to start. So you can't cryopreserve a person um, whose heart has stopped beating like two days before. It has to be quite quick. It's a matter of minutes. Um, you start the process by decreasing the temperature of the person, for instance, the um, ice bath. Um, and then you start replacing uh, the blood uh, in the veins with a substance that doesn't freeze because blood is made in largest part of water and uh, water in the cells um, 
expands when you freeze it or at a very low temperature, so you want to avoid that because you don't want to cause damage to the body. Um, and then these um, these uh, these bodies um, are um, preserved um, in liquid nitrogen, um, which is also where um, we um, preserve um, embryos, for instance, the embryos that we use for in vitro fertilization. So um, they're kept in these um, facilities. I think there are two or three in the world. and. Um, and for what we know, they can stay cryopreserved in that state indefinitely. Um, and, and this is the first part and, um, of cryonics. You figure out more or less how to do that. There are, there are various places where you can get this procedure done. Uh, what we haven't really figured out yet is the second part of cryonics, which is how to revive these patients, uh, these people, so that they can restart living. Um, of course, the second part is also very important uh, because the, the goal of cryonics um, is to extend the life of the patient. Um, so, for instance, imagine the case of a person who has, um, who has cancer and they know they don't have much time left to live. Um, because the cancer is, is killing them, there is no cure. Um, so what they can do is to have cryonics and hope that um, in the future, perhaps in 50 years, 100 years, um, there will be a treatment for the cancer <clears throat> so that they can be uh, revived and the cancer can be cured. And ideally, this usually the idea is that cryonics should go um, paired with life extension as well. So suppose you have cancer at 80 and it's not possible to cure cancer, you have cryonics, then you come back after 50 years, suppose in a future where we have found out a way to um, to bring back to life the people who were cry cryopreserved, but also to cure cancer. But anyway, if we haven't really managed to um, also work on life extension, and you're, and you're brought back to life at 80, even if you're cancer-free, even cryo, if cryopreservation worked, uh, your lifespan is gonna be very limited. So you can live for maybe 10, 20 years at most. So the big project related to cryonics is that of indefinite life extension. So cryonics should be a step um, to, um, to sort of stay alive, to have a chance to, to come back to life. Um, but the final goal should be that of having indefinite life extension and to live either forever or for a much longer time than we actually do now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that period during which the person is cryopreserved, uh, should we consider the person to be dead or is she still alive? That's a difficult question. So um, I think that you know, we used to have this um, black and white view of being alive and being dead. And, um, and it was the case for all the human history until some medical technologies were introduced and actually we now have a lot of gray area, gray areas. One is cryonics, and I'm going to explain why. But also, like if you think of people in a vegetative state, these are people who are kept alive. Um, they often have uh, artificial nutrition and hydration, sometimes artificial ventilation, but they're not conscious. They're not really living um, their life. Like it's, in a sense, they are they're dead and in, in many cases indeed if the family agrees then you can remove the artificial ventilation artificial um, hydration and uh, and let them die but obviously there is a huge difference between you and me speaking now and having this conversation and a person who is in a vegetative state in a hospital they're you know they're not really dead but they're not really alive and uh, this gray area has been introduced by technology and cryonics is one of these technologies. So the according to the definition of death that you you use, 
you may say that cry people were cry preserved are dead or alive. So if you think that a person is dead when their heart stops beating, they're definitely dead. If you think that people are dead when uh, their brain stops working, uh, which is the most common um, definition of death that we that we use in hospitals in healthcare, and then they're dead. <clears throat> or some people use like a certain part of the brain um, as a not the whole brain as it stops working. But anyway, by all of these medical definition um, that we that we use, they they are dead. However, people who think the cryonics uh, might be a chance to to be shipped to the future um, they they think that actually uh, there is a different account of death that we shouldn't uh, we should take, take into consideration and um, and it's called information theoretical death so the idea is that insofar as your the information stored in your brain um, is not lost is not so uh, corrupted that you could couldn't be able to to rescue it then you're not uh, dead according to the information theoretical account of that it means that if you think i think this metaphor works really well like if you imagine if you think of um, a computer um so if you save um all the data, all the information, all the programs in your computer, you pretty much have like on your storage, like the copy of your computer, even if your computer as it is now um, gets completely destroyed. Um, you can still take that data and upload it on a new computer and you would have for intensive purposes the same computer you had before. Because what matters for your computer is not really the keyboard uh, and the screen and other parts, it's the data that matters to you. And similar um, reason can apply, should apply, I think it, it actually applies to humans. So again, like <clears throat> those people in the hospital in a vegetative state, um, if they're, the data in their brain has has gone lost because, for instance, they had like a very bad accident and their brain got uh, severe injuries. The data can't be taken, uh, can't be resumed, can't be saved. So according to this account, even though they are breathing and, you know, um, their body is still working, they are dead because they will never get, get back their all their information, which is or your memories, or your mental states, um, it's pretty much you. I mean, in a sense, we are our, our brain. Um, so according to these accounts, what cryonics is, is doing is making sure that the information in your brain um, doesn't get uh, corrupted, doesn't get lost. And the hope is that in the reviving process, when we revive the, the people from cryonics, they will never be able to do that. Um, that information, or at least large part of the information, will still be there, so that you can be revived from cryonics after not 20, 50, 100 years, and uh, and you can say, oh, it's me, I remember, you know, uh, I, I feel like myself, even though you've been posed um, for a long time. Um, if cryonics doesn't achieve that goal, if people wake up and it's like completely blank or like, you know, their body is working, but their brain is not really working or then it has failed in a sense. So what matters is that the information um, is not corrupted. And I think in that sense, again, like it depends on whether, yeah, which account of death you, you use. So are they dead or alive? Well, it depends on what you mean by dead or alive. Um, a doctor in a hospital will tell you, yes, they're definitely dead because their brain is not working. But a cryonic will tell you, no, they're not really dead because there is a chance that their um, the data, the memories, everything in their brain um, will come back when we revive them. So it's hard to tell if yes or no, it's, it's a difficult answer. <laughs>
Right. And uh, this raises another interesting question. At a certain point, you mentioned that one potential goal of cryonics would be to extend life indefinitely. But would this be a good thing? Would someone becoming immortal be a good thing? Um, it is something philosophers have discussed for a very long time. Um, and I think that the majority of philosophers got to the conclusion that it would be bad to live indefinitely, to be mortal. Um, the main reason is that they think um, some of the main reasons that um, life would be boring. So eventually after living for so long, you'll be bored or your life um, wouldn't really feel human because to be human means to have limited time and when you have infinite time um, that's not human life anymore so your life would be unrecognizable as a human other people have argued that you wouldn't recognize your life as your life because the time span would be so long that you would get lost in all these years you've been living so we can keep only ourselves together if we live for a short time um, and um, I think these are the, the, some of the main, the main arguments, like the, the idea that death anyway gives a meaning to life, that you know, we, we, we understand life only in relation to death. Um, I think there are some good points there, um, but I think that um, it's, it's hard to tell if we don't try. And I think that in part, the reason why we think about a very long life being extremely boring is that perhaps we imagine people like aging and aging and becoming more and more decrepit and less and less able of doing the things they like. So as we age, um, you know, we become weaker, uh, we have less energy, um, we lose health, um, we can do much less, we lose part of the memory and the people around us, like we started having like people dying or age and so on. So if you imagine that process continues in that continuing indefinitely, that obviously looks horrible and nobody would sign up for that. But if you could pair um, getting older, you could, if you could un unmatch getting older and aging, uh, I think that would be a much different story. So if we could, um, as I said before, like um, the, the plan of cryonics is like to, to be linked to indefinite life extension and indefinite life extension is also linked to rejuvenating technology. So if we can stop aging um, or reverse aging, um, then getting older, um, living 500, uh, 2000 years would, would look very, very different. Uh, imagine having the same energy you, you have when you're 20 or 30 forever. Um, that would be a completely different experience from, you know, living up to 100 and, and being very fragile and, and old. Um, it is less likely, I think, that we, we, we that we would get bored of living just because we had opportunity of doing so many things, like we could travel places, um, we would have the energy of doing these things, we would have the energy of achieving a lot of other goals that now we can't achieve. Now the more we live, the more we have doors um, closing in front of us like you make a choice you can't undo it and then you just have you just have to continue in that way and i think that's tragic uh, i think that's tragic that we can't really undo life a lot of things we can't really undo like uh once you have sex for the first time you no longer you're not, not gonna be a virgin ever again uh, even if you live for a million years so some things even uh with um, endless times uh, can't be undone but for a lot of other things like I chose in this life to be a philosopher but you know maybe I would have you know it would have been interesting to have a different life in which done. I would have done a different a different job or uh, lived in a different place there are so so many options and we just never experienced that because we always get old and and age at the same time. 
Um, and I'm so surprised that people don't really care about aging that much. It thinks, seems to me that it's such a tragic thing that happens to everyone um, to age, like all of the diseases we experience uh, from Parkinson, Alzheimer, cancer, they're, we know they're very strictly related to aging. And we're trying to fix them, which is great, but we should fix aging because aging is the source of all of these. And even if you get to your 90s without a particular disease, you're still not going to be in good shape. It's still going to be more difficult, more boring for you to live compared to when you're 20. Um, so, yeah, I find it really strange that people are not freaking out about aging. I'm freaking out. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest thing we should work on. Like, why do we age? <clears throat> why can't we stop it? What are we doing? Um, yeah. Yeah. So changing topics now, you also talk about lookism in your work. So why is it why should we worry about biases in favor of attractive people or against unattractive people? Um, yeah, I think we should worry about biases uh, against unattractive people most of all because um, we know from a lot of research uh, in in psychology and in economics uh, that unattractive people. Um, have a lot of disadvantages um, it has been measured from an economic perspective. So we know that <clears throat> unattractive people earn less compared to average looking people and average looking people earn less than, <clears throat> sorry, I need a sip of water. Sure. Um, and attractive people um, earn more than average looking people. I think, um, it's like $120,000 uh, on average, but of course, depend on your job and how attractive and attractive you are, but it's, it's quite a lot of money. And um, we know that unattractive people struggle more to, uh, to find a job and they're called back less when they send their CV. Um, they, um, they have a lot of um, disadvantages in, related to the work uh, area, but not all that. Um, maybe people have already intuition that um, there is it's more difficult to find a partner if you're less attractive, especially for men, uh, but um, same for women. Um, so your romantic life is going to be affected, obviously, by how attractive you are or not. Um, there is some evidence that um, attractive people are more likely to win the elections as well, um, and um, so if it, or to uh, raise uh, more money for charity. So it seems to affect a lot of areas of life. So like whether you're raising money for a charity or you're in politics, you're a student, um, the way you interact with other people, your friends. Uh, there are so many areas of human experience that are affected by by how attractive and attractive we are. Um, and uh, it seems to me that this disadvantage um, should be should be discussed. Like um, the term lookism um, refers to more known forms of discrimination, um, such as racism, or ageism, um, and, and so on and so forth. But um, I think that lookism has been really um, underestimated. Like we know that it affects the life of people, um, but um, it seems that it doesn't raise my attack and doesn't uh, prompt much reflection in, in philosophy. I think it got better in the last few years when I started working on this topic, nobody was working on it. Now there are a few more people. So I think there's made some progress there. Um, I think it's not it's not really enough yet. Um, so the issues there, indeed, like not that the attractive people have an advantage, good for them, but of course that you know the problem is that the attractive people have a disadvantage. So some people say that well, we shouldn't really do anything about it. Um, it's just a matter of luck. Um, so. Um, 
what what are we gonna do um i think that's um that's too dismissive um if we know that a group of people uh, suffers from a form of discrimination um the least we can do is start looking into it i think there are like different kind of um actions um that we can we can take well first of all i think people should become aware of the fact that there is this form of discrimination i think that helps a lot just to acknowledge our own lookism um like am i behaving in 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 a different way towards the person who is attractive am i um am i being more dismissive of what they're saying just because they're unattractive I'm not saying that everybody does that, but there is enough evidence that most people do that. It's like we don't really realize it's a form of implicit bias, um, but uh, it seems that there is quite enough evidence that actually we are quite lookist. So first of all, we start acknowledging that we are lookist and we start reflecting on our um, behavior and actions that that can start uh, making a difference. Um, the other thing is whether like among the people who agree about the the need to intervene to change um the look is biased or to do something about it some people say that the only thing we should do is to intervene socially so um promoting more equality um but also um perhaps introducing um anti-lookism legislations um so for instance, similar to the ones that uh, address the discrimination against disabled people or um, uh, racist um, behaviors in the workplace or in society. And that's definitely something we could we could consider, something worth discussing. Um, but I and I think that can achieve a lot, but I don't think that's the whole story. I don't think that um, addressing the social part of lookism is going to solve the problem. I think that in some cases, at least, but perhaps in the worst cases, um, we need to intervene also uh, medically. So what we have now is cosmetic surgery. Uh, I think that people were victim of lookism and want to do something about it and we have good reasons to to believe they actually experience that uh, of course if you know brad pitt says i'm a victim of lookism we would laugh at that you know that that's not true but like if there is like a medical assessment and people can agree okay yes it, yeah you are quite an attractive according to these standards of beauty then uh, I think it would make sense to provide free cosmetic surgery. Um, and indeed, a lot of countries already do that. Um, I mean, not for all cases, but um, there is some free cosmetic surgery for, for people. For instance, people, the young children can have their ears pinned back um, if they have protruding ears in most countries. And it's not because protruding ears are the most uh, or the worst um, facial features are just because it's very easy and very cheap to fix them. But then it seems kind of unfair to say, well, if your an attractive feature is protruding ears, we'll do it for free. If you're attractive, if your an attractive feature is, I don't know, your nose or your chin or something else, well, sorry, no, you can't have it for free. It seems like a really irrational way of distributing resources or, or addressing the, the issue that a person is experiencing. So I think that we should um, provide more free cosmetic surgery for people who request it and need it. Um, and perhaps in the future, we will be able to use um, genetic intervention to intervene before. Uh, so instead of pinning the ears back, when the child is born, perhaps there is like a little gene we can tweak to make sure that that's not developed. And same goes for any other feature. I think that the main disagreement about the um, strategy that is best to use to address lookism comes from a disagreement about um, the source of lookism and, and again about the source of our aesthetic preferences. Some people believe that the aesthetic preferences are entirely 
induced by society. They are just a byproduct of society. And if we change society, um, then we can change uh, aesthetic preferences. Um, and I think it's true for some features. So, for instance, our preference for very um, skinny uh, women or for um, you know, blonde hair or white skin, that's a, that's a society-induced preference. We were not evolved to have that preference. But there is also some evidence suggesting that our aesthetic preferences are a byproduct of evolution, at least some of them are. So like our preference for symmetry, um, it's a byproduct of evolution. We like symmetrical things, we like also symmetrical bodies and symmetrical faces. Uh, our preference for smooth skin is also a byproduct of, of evolution. Um, there are some features that it's really difficult to get um, rid of, like we, we're evolved to prefer these things. It's like we've evolved to prefer sugary uh, food um, than, uh, you know, mm, foods where less calorie dense. And that's that's just like because during our evolutionary history that having sugary food um, increased our chances of surviving. Same goes for some features. So um, there used to be like evolving, like there is a link between like symmetry and health or like good skin and health. Of course, now it doesn't really matter because we have medicine. So, um, but imagine like a society in which, like, a time where um, you know um, there was like the plague, and like if people had like signs of plague on their face, that was a very useful indication that the person was contagious and that you shouldn't get close to them. And well, even if now you know maybe people had the plague and were not contagious because medicine can fix it, or the plague were not as lethal. Um, we still have that preference because we've evolved with that preference, and that goes for a lot of, uh, of, of aesthetic preferences we have. We are born with them, so I think that in those cases, it becomes very difficult to say, uh, "Oh well, society, we should change." You know, society is responsible for the preference for symmetry. Well, that's uh, that's not true. Maybe in you know continuing our evolution, we will get rid of that preference. But right now, um, I don't think we can change the preference for symmetry by changing society. I think we can change the preference for skinny people by changing society because, yeah, that's not something we have evolved with, quite to the contrary. Um, but um, some preferences are just like hardwired in our brain. So I think people disagree a lot about what strategy to use to fight leukism because they disagree a lot about what is the source, uh, the origin of our aesthetic preferences. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about some medical procedures and the ethics behind them, like abortion, euthanasia, cosmetic surgery, cryonics. Um, there's uh, one aspect that we haven't talked about yet, that is conscientious objection. So I, I don't know if you want to apply it to these cases or others, but what are the kinds of situations where it is morally permissible for doctors to evoke conscientious objection and not perform one of these practices? Um, I don't think there is any case uh, where it's morally permissible for a doctor to refuse um, to perform an abortion, um, for instance. I guess it depends a lot on the kind of treatment. So, But if a treatment is legal in a certain country, um, then it seems to me that the good doctor is the doctor who performs all the treatments that are made available in the country where they live. So, for instance, in Italy, we have a lot of cases of um, doctors who refuse to perform abortion or even to um, prescribe the morning after pill. And uh, some pharmacists refuse to uh, to sell the morning after pill, even with a prescription, because in Italy you need a prescription. Um, and um, there are also uh, nurses or doctors who refuse to help the patient who had an abortion always about to have an abortion, so they don't want to perf to give it an aesthetic, for instance, because they don't want to be involved in the abortion because they think they are 
um, complacent in wrongdoing. Um, and um, I understand, I understand that uh, if you think that abortion is is uh, equivalent to murder, or um, then you don't want to be involved in any activity. So you don't want to tell people how to get somebody who who performs a murder for you. Uh, you don't want to um, to give them any information that they can use to kill somebody. You just like murder is such a horrible thing to do that you don't want to be involved. So if you think that abortion is murder, I understand that doctors don't want to be involved. But then the solution is not to become the kind of doctor who performs abortion. It's like in Italy, it's mostly gynecologist. You just should go in a different area of medicine because the health system um, and the scientific community had decided that that's a treatment that we should provide to patients and the patients have a rise to good health assistance and therefore um, the doctor has the professional obligation to perform it. So um, I'm, I, I, I think that a lot of people who are against conscientious objections like me, they, they tend to to think like, oh well, but you know, for you know, the doctor is wrong. It's not really, you know, we shouldn't really consider the um, their concerns about complicity. They're not really complicit. I think they are complicit. I think they're perfectly right in not wanting to be involved in in something they consider to be immoral. I think they're wrong in thinking that's immoral, but that's completely irrelevant. Um, but I think that when you when you are uh, when you're a doctor, um, then you have the duty to perform the legal, safe uh, procedures that um, the country you live in has uh, asked you to perform. Different is the case if you want an abortion in a case in a country where abortion is illegal, or if you want euthanasia in a country where it's illegal. That's a completely different issue. Of course, you can say no, you shouldn't do illegal things, but if the procedure is legal and the patient is entitled to have it, um, you have to perform it. Mm -hmm. So now talking about another topic, um, let's. Uh, I wanted to know more about the Journal of Controversial Ideas. So I, I've had on the show Peter Singer and Jeff McMahon, the other two co-founders of the journal. Why did you decide to create this journal? I mean, what are the sorts of issues that you find in academia and perhaps in other journals that you want to tackle with this journal? Um. Well, after I published that article that we mentioned at the beginning, um, a lot, I got a lot of um, death threats and um, um, and um, I, I noticed that I wasn't really getting job offers um, and some job offers were taken back or like they were told like, we can't offer you this job because you're too controversial. And people started coming to me and tell me like, oh, well, you were really brave. Um, I could have done that. And uh, there are some, you know, maybe I agree with you, but I would never say that in public. So I started realizing that there was a lot of um, fear around publishing controversial ideas in academia. But I thought it was an isolated case. I mean, I knew that Peter Singer already had had some uh, death threats and he had been... Um, attacked um, during some presentations and like he had not he had been invited from conferences and so on and so forth but um, I thought okay well it's it's just um, it's just a few cases um, but then time passed by and still realizing that this was becoming more and more common and I think uh, in, you know the um, been cases of quite a lot of cases now of academics that had um, their, they lost their jobs or they got petitions signed against them because they published a paper considered controversial. And um, that seemed very dangerous to me um, because in academia you have to be able to discuss all, all ideas even the ones that are controversial because academia is not about um, discussing the world 
how you would like it to be. It's about trying to to find the truth. So uh, if people are really scared about presenting new models or talking about ideas because they think that, you know, they're going to have a petition uh, against them or they're going to be fired, then we're not really um, helping them to find the truth to, to do their job. Um, so we thought that the journal uh, could could be a good option for people who want to share these ideas um, to get closer to the truth without um, having to um, have petitions against them because uh, in our journal you can publish anonymously or using a pseudonym actually um, so people can still share their ideas so their ideas can be out there uh, but hopefully they will not be attacked um, by uh, by colleagues um, or people who want to get rid of them uh, professionally or in my case it was also like um, physically <laughs> so um, the idea is that to provide a space for discussing ideas without um, too much emphasis on the person who wrote the idea because we are in academia to discuss ideas not people and a lot of these attacks are really um, towards the person uh, not towards the idea and that's that's really not what academia should be Mm -hmm. uh, but what are controversial ideas in this case? Because since it is still an academic journal, I mean, are there any limits in terms of the ideas that you accept being published there? Um, if the idea is well, if the paper is well argued um, and, uh, you know, we have a very tough uh, peer review, um, if it goes through peer review and it's accepted um, and the experts agree it's a good paper, uh, the topic is, um, is not a problem. Uh, one thing we're not going to publish is uh, like somebody giving like detailed uh, instruction about how to build weapons or a super virus. So anything that can be an immediate threat. Um, so things like that. But apart from that, insofar as talking about ideas, um, that there is, I don't think there should be any limit um, to the, the ideas that can be discussed um, if it's done in good faith and um, with empirical evidence or good reasoning. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think this will be my final question. Uh, so do you think that nowadays uh, we have more backlash against uh, controversial ideas in acad expressed in academia than before? And do you think that, for example, things like the internet facilitate that because it's easier to for even anonymous people to reach the authors and uh, threat them in, uh, fre uh, threatening them in any way or something like that? Um, I think it's it depends on where you're comparing. If you're comparing to like 30, 40, 20 years ago, I think we have less academic freedom and it's less safe. But I was reading books about like the Enlightenment and what the situation was during the Enlightenment. And of course, like there was less academic freedom and, you know, think of people like Socrates. So, you know, the, this is not um, a new a uh, new phenomenon, but it's definitely new um, in compared to to a few years ago uh, where we had more academic freedom. I think that the internet um, made a difference, um, at least in some cases, um, but because now it has become like, like everybody can jump on the Mm, on the list of, uh, of people attacking you. So like there is more interest um, in what academics do as well, which I think is great. I think that's amazing that the internet has allowed people to know about my research on the research of a lot of other people. And, you know, it's, 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 it's actually like one of the best things that happened in academia in the, in the last years, but it comes with a, with a, with a prize. So the problem, though is not i used to think i've changed my, my, my mind about that i used to think that the problem was people um you know sending you death threats and attacking you uh for something controversial you had written 
um, because I experienced, experienced that myself. But I've changed my mind about that. I don't think that's the problem. I think that's that's fine. I mean, I, I don't think it's nice to send a death threat, but um, anyway, it's it's perfectly um, uh, it's perfectly fine with me at least. Um, but what is what is the problem is the reaction of the institutions. So I, if people get angry and pe but people can be like the general public, can be students, can be colleagues signing petitions. If the university fires you because people have disagree with you and you know they write a petition, that's a huge problem. But that doesn't come from the people necessarily. That's the just the institution that are really failing us. They're failing academia. They're um, they're not uh, defending and protecting the academic freedom of the people working from them. They're just saying, "Oh, sorry, somebody doesn't like you. I guess I'll have to fire you." Well, no, that should never, never, never happen uh, unless somebody you know really violates some basic. Um, principles of you know like respect and defamation like if you know committing doing something like really horrible to their colleagues but if you're just writing your paper and uh, you're just expressing your idea and you think you have arguments or data for some idea and you want to share it with your colleagues and have a conversation like oh i think this uh, what do you think about it and your colleague should be like, oh no i disagree with you um i think that you know you didn't analyze this data probably or you didn't consider this counter argument that's how you make progress and he's like oh yes you're right no let me change that or like let me analyze these other elements but that's not what happens anymore so say so you publish a controversial paper you can have a petition of people trying to fire you and then the university fires you how are we gonna make any progress in this situation where people just get angry and or you know or or fired. Um, I'm I'm seriously worried about this this situation, and I really hope that the journal controversial ideas will uh, will help to make a change in this direction. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just one final question. This came to my mind now. Do you think that the biggest threats to academic freedom come from within academia itself or from other sources like, I don't know, g the general public or politicians or others? Um, I think it's um, it's all connected, um, but I think right now the main threat to academia is probably coming from academics like those academics who um, who want to get their colleagues fired. Um, but they um, but the effect of this um, um, change in institution, like this is a very new phenomenon that didn't happen up to five years ago. Like, uh, you know, in most cases, like maybe there have been a few cases, but like academics denouncing other academics and asking for them to be fired that's you know that's really quite new um but also i mean that i think that then society um gets gets involved so like we are creating an environment which we're telling people you know it's it's okay to 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 overreact it's okay to try to silence like or to, at least we're telling our students it's okay to try to silence speakers you don't want to hear to. It's okay to try to remove from the syllabus the topics you don't want to have discussed, but that's not how we teach, right? I mean, like our job as teachers is to help the students to think critically, to think for themselves, to learn to disagree. They don't have to learn just all the things that they already, already agree with. They have to learn to deal with with people who think differently. And I think we're failing them in that respect because now when students say, I don't want to talk about a topic, I want to remove that topic from from the syllabus, I don't want to do that reading. It was like, oh, okay, well, that's perfectly fine. Let's remove it. But uh, that's, that's not really what we should do. Um, I think we should take into account their preferences. We should discuss with them. We should explain and be really careful and uh, not just like throwing information at them without helping them because yeah some students can be more sensitive but 
I think it's really an important skill um, to learn to disagree, to learn to consider all the different arguments. I mean, this is philosophy. Um, it is about bouncing ideas and about you know talking to each other and and it's it's really enriching to disagree we can't really make any any progress at all if we never find somebody who disagrees with us like the best ideas i had like the way i had improved my my thinking and my papers was just talking about these ideas with people who had a completely different view I owe everything to, to them because otherwise I would have not really improved. And I really want students and other people to learn to enjoy the process of disagreeing, to be exposed to things that make us feel uncomfortable for a little bit. But then we reflect upon our feeling uncomfortable and and we can make a better argument. That's you know, it's it doesn't have to be necessarily a very pleasant process all the way, but when you learn to recognize that it feels like, ah oh, yeah, now I feel that way, I feel uncomfortable because this is touching a chord I'm very sensitive about. Why am I very sensitive? Why am I feeling like this? And then you get out, come up with a better argument, and that's amazing, and that's the best part of philosophy. Okay, great. So let's end on that note. Just before we go, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work? Um, yes, I have a website that I should um, um, take better care of. It's called francescaminerva.com. Um, and if you want to visit also like the Journal of Controversial Ideas, it's journalofcontroversialideas.org. And we haven't published the first issue yet, but we think it will come up in April. It's open access, and so it's for free for everybody to read. And if you want to make a small donation, we also have like a PayPal bot on our website. And um, um, yes, that's it. <laughs> Okay, I will be leaving all of that in the description box of the interview. Thank and you. Francesca, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Likewise, thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. My channel is now more than three years old, and to keep it sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, you can also find links to it in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Pereira Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan V. Selenian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassi, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguenzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andre, F. Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T., Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Pliz, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, my producers, Cesar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafinia, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardas France, and Niruban Balachandran. And finally, my executive producers, Michel Ruzieski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.